Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Reed Phillips. I'm a board member of the uh, Foreign Policy Association, and tonight I'm introducing our uh, distinguished speaker, Angela Kane, uh, the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs at the United Nations, a position she assumed in March of 2012. Uh, she advises the Secretary General on matters of arms control, non-proliferation, -prol and related security issues. Ms. Kane has had an impressive career at the UN with assignments in political affairs, peacekeeping, and disarmament, and in several managerial positions. Some of her recent roles were Under Secretary General for Management, Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs, and Assistant Secretary General uh, for General Assembly and Conference Management. Ms. Kane is from Germany, where she studied at the University of Munich, uh, she's also studied in the United States at Bryn Mawr College and Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Ms. Kane. Uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, listen to uh, hear me talk. I don't have a set talk. I have a number of slides that I want to give you, and I'm going to talk to the slides. And I'm hoping that there will be plenty of questions afterwards. And uh, thank you also for the introduction. I must tell you that when I took this job, last March, Syria was not really in my eyesight. We had never done anything in Syria in disarmament, and uh, so it was quite a surprise when uh, actually the events happened when they started on the uh, 19th of March. But before I go to that, let me, and I'm not quite sure I need to point to this down here, down there. There we go. Let me just talk a little bit about what mechanism uh, was used. And that was on 19th of March, uh, the uh, Syrians came to the Secretary General and said, we would like you to investigate uh, and the use of chemical weapons. Our troops were attacked uh, in Aleppo, in Khan al-Assal. It's a suburb of Aleppo, and uh, we need you to mount an investigation right away. Now, what do we do in such a case? I mean, this doesn't come out of thin air. And so we have something that is called a mechanism, the Secretary General's mechanism for the investigation of alleged use of chemical, biological, and toxin weapons. And that mechanism is, as you can see, it's a tool to carry out investigations. And it's actually a pretty big document. It's about 90 pages long. And in these 90 pages, it has a total I a manual, so to say, about how do you carry out these investigations. And the first thing you do is that when the state comes to you and says there is an allegation of an attack of chemical weapons, then you ask the state questions. You have like a list of questions, indicative questions that the state has to answer, because you have to have some facts to start with. And so these were the basis of it. Secretary General very quickly turned around and said, yes, I will accept it. But the mechanism can really be triggered by any state. Any state can come to the Secretary General and ask for such an investigation uh, that they believe is well-founded. And as I said, as you can see here, it started in 1987, but there's a history to this. And the history is that there were several investigations that were conducted in the 80s on the Iraq use of chemical weapons. And that was also conducted by the United Nations. And let me come to something right away because I'll come back to that a little bit later. And that is that in those Iraq investigations, there was actually an explicit request to the Secretary General to attribute accountability. Who was accountable? Who was responsible for that attack? And when the General Assembly, when the member states devised this tool a couple of years, three, four years afterwards, they decided expressly not to have that included in the mechanism. And that's a very important fact because there's been a lot written about why does the Secretary General not come out and say who is responsible for the attacks. But again, it was uh, decided, it was first there was like an expert group of, me of people who put this together, then it was a General Assembly resolution, and then later on it was endorsed uh, by the um, Se Security Council. And um, so, um, sorry. So what we have is that uh, the you have the mechanism, and then you have guidelines and procedures, this 90-page manual, as I mentioned, and then you have a roster of experts and laboratories. Now, what does that mean? Now, in disarmament, we don't have any experts that are chemists, that are biomedical experts, that are doctors. And so what we do is we have a cooperative mechanism. And just the year before, I had actually signed a memorandum of understanding with the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, to do precisely that, to basically cement our cooperation and to regulate it. What do we do? What kicks it off? What are each other's responsibility? So in fact, it came in extremely handy, unbeknownst to anyone of us who at that time signed it. 
And so this roster of expert meant that I would turn around, I would call up the Director General of the OPCW, and I'd say, uh, Director General Ahmed Uzumchu, we need your help, we need your experts to conduct this investigation. The same we did with the World Health Organization, because w OPCW has the chemical and the weapons experts, OPCW needed to give us the doctors. So the team, in fact, was composed of nine OPCW experts and four WHO experts who were doctors in, in clinical uh, uh, matters to investigate. Now then we needed to find, first of all, we needed to find a head of the mission. And again, in good diplomatic practice, this has to be consulted with the state concerned, i.e. Syria. So, you know, this had to be done extremely quickly. So I kind of scouted around, called up people on the weekends, called them up on vacations, and said, would you be willing to take this on? And then in the end, I proposed three, not names, but I proposed three continents to the Syrians. And then when it came to one continent, they said, which country? So I told them, and they said, no, 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 not from that country. The other restriction was, and this is again very important to keep in mind, that they sort of said no one from the P5 countries can participate. Now the P5 are the permanent members of the Security Council, that's the US, uh, Russian Federation, United Kingdom, China, uh, and uh, France. So we could not have experts. Now I to ask you, where are most of the experts in this field coming from? So we had a real problem. And in the end, the person who was appointed and the uh, Syrians agreed to this, and I said he was from a Nordic country, I didn't tell them which one, a Nordic country, was Professor Arke Selström. And Professor Selström was working at a laboratory, actually on chemical, biological, and radiological weapons, was teaching also, had been involved in the Iraq investigations, and turned out to be a perfect choice. So we put this together, the Syrians agreed to it, and then came the next step. And again, next slide, you have basically, this is the, the procedure, member states providing information, including answering this questionnaire. And I will tell you that the Syrians turned it around extremely quickly. They gave us pages and pages of information that we should have to base our investigation on. And then the Secretary General informs the member states, receives approval of the respective state to conduct an investigation. Now that's really important, and that's where the whole thing fell a bit into, into turmoil. Because when we conduct it, and we have to conclude a legal agreement, Syria is a sovereign member state of the United Nations, you can't just go in there. They're not under sanctions, uh, they're not under any regime that basically says to us, you know, it's not like Iraq, you can go in there, or you couldn't go in there at the time. But basically, they have to agree that we go in and investigate. And so the Secretary General, who had, in the several days following this allegation about the incident in Aleppo, Khan al-Assal, he had received a number of other allegations of chemical weapons use from other member states. And so he decided to add one more allegation to this to be investigated. And the Syrians blocked and said, no, we do not agree with that. We do not agree that you investigate only Khan al-Assal, that's fine, but we do not agree to any other uh, investigation that you wish to uh, wish to carry out. We're not Iraq. Uh, we do not agree that you can you can do this. So that's basically where it stopped. And then there was a hiatus for some time. Now let me show you the other times that this was used, the Secretary General's mechanism. And again, that's extremely important because it is a mechanism that's existed and that we've been basically been keeping current, but that's only been used twice in its entire existence before. And that was in Mozambique and in Azerbaijan. Both of those were in 1992. And let me tell you, both of them were totally inconclusive. Nothing came out of it. Couldn't prove that chemical weapons were used, and so therefore, it's just on the record books, but really, it did not really contribute to any, any effect finding. So here we go to the timeline in Syria. 19 March, as I mentioned, Syria comes to the Secretary General, and then 21 March, Secretary General establishes a fact finding mission, and between the 21 March and 25 August, and remember in early Aug and mid August we had the incident in uh, near Damascus in in Hauta, there were 16 allegations in total, which were received by the Secretary General. 16 allegations of chemical weapons use. And again, what we did with all of these allegations, we sent a letter to the member states, but very often it was difficult to even get to the truth of it or to get to the facts of it because it was sometimes second hand, sometimes it was even third hand, very often it was in rebel territory, it was very difficult to get actually the facts of it. And what we did is we assembled this team of nine OPCW, four WHO, and the team leader, they assembled in The Hague, 
had training. And you know, again, it's one of those things where you sort of say, well, there are four difficulties that you have not foreseen. One of the difficulties war was that they were going into a country that was at war and they needed very specialized uh, security training very specialized security. You can't just send someone into a fighting area and so say, now please, you know, be on your own and yes, we'll give you an armored vehicle. So that was one of the things that we, uh, we also had to do. And the, we also deployed an advanced team in Cyprus. And we did it in Cyprus because, you know, the closest country, the neighboring country is Lebanon, but Lebanon is in itself in a very difficult in situation. They don't have a government right now and they were very fragile and they said we cannot do this out of Cyprus, we cannot do this out of Lebanon, we cannot do it out of Beirut, you have to do it out of another country. So Cyprus was the closest that we could go to. We pre-positioned some people there to sort of say when we conclude this agreement with the Syrians, we can go in you know, any minute and basically we're ready uh, to go. So what they did while this stalled, while this negotiation with the Syrians stalled, uh, we actually sent the team around because they weren't just sitting idle. They were going through a lot of material. And it is amazing what you can find. It's not only on the internet, but there was also a human rights commission, for example, which had conducted a lot of interviews with, uh, with survivors, with victims, and so forth. So there was a lot of material that they had. And they also went to a neighboring country, and I can tell you that that was Turkey. They went to a neighboring country and went to refugee camps and basically interviewed the people there, all in order to, to ascertain facts. Now what happened then is that after this stalemate, uh, there were some discussions with the Syrian government that I had, and uh, I sort of said, well, there's no point really in keeping this investigation alive if we can't go on the ground. I think we have done our fact-finding outside the country, but in any case, if this does not change, then I think we're going to have to close the mission. And so all of a sudden, a couple of days later, the uh, Syrian government uh, called me and said, we'd like you to come together with the team leader to Damascus to negotiate this. And so I went, and you can see here under the portrait of Assad, President Assad, I'm sitting there with the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and discussing how are we actually going to handle that. Now, that was not the only meeting. It was actually two days of very tough negotiations. And you know how, you, how it is. You get there, you're jet lagged. Uh, you're there in Ramadan, so I think we were both kind of a bit, uh, all sides were damaged goods, so a little bit to sort of say. Very tough negotiations, because they still insisted you have to do Khan al -Assar. And in the end, what I negotiated with them was we will do the investigation in Khan al -Assar, but we will do two additional investigations two additional sites that have been indicated to us as being uh, uh, reported use of chemical weapons. We will do that. We will do it simultaneously. We will do it concurrently, not one first and then the other two. We will do it at the same time. And we will not tell you what those two sites are in addition until we have concluded the legal agreement. And then we went again back to the drawing board with a legal agreement, took again a couple of days to sort it out because it's back and forth and the mission here in uh, New York does not have all of the plenipotentiary powers. It has to go back to Damascus, then we would get documents back in Arabic. I must tell you that all of this sounds very easy, but it's actually fairly labor intensive and, and difficult. But we did get the agreement done and then we told them what the sites were. Now why did we not disclose that? the chemical evidence or the evidence of a chemical attack deteriorates after a certain amount of time and what we didn't want is either side, whether it's the government or the opposition, to obliterate traces and also to adulterate the site in any fair shape or form. You know, we wanted it to be kept till the last moment and we kept it. So what happened is that on 18 August, the mission deploys to Damascus. Now you've all seen pictures of, of the team coming out of out of the hotel in Damascus. I thought I'd show you a different one. This is actually at the border when we went in. Uh, and uh, while the team was in Damascus investigating those other three incidents and discussing with the government and getting more evidence from them, that's exactly when the incident in Ghouta happened. It was on the 21st of August. And what then happened is that the government, they asked the government, the team asked the government to go into these areas to investigate. And the government said, oh, no, 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 that was not our agreement. Our agreement was for those, you know, one site, Aleppo, Khan al -Assal, and the other two, but not for Ghouta. And I had not gone with the mission because I wanted to draw the line between the political work and the scientific work. I mean, these were experts that were doing scientific work and I didn't want to muddy the waters. So I flew right back into, um, into Damascus and negotiated another two days with the government and they finally agreed that we, would, we, would, we were able to go in. 
Now, I tell you that the difficulty is the government basically said, now, where exactly do you want to go? Now, how do I know that? I don't have any intelligence information. So what we did is we basically looked at the internet and we looked at some of the YouTube videos and maybe there was a GPS indication somewhere. And then, you know, we sort of said, now, well, how can we plot this? Because the government wanted more specifics. How can we plot this? So what we did is we gave them an area that was about two and a half kilometers long and about a kilometer and a half wide. And so said, that's the area we want to go into. But I think you have to also understand the difficulties of trying to get something like this organized because it's very... It's very hard to, d to negotiate this with a government who really is reluctant to, to give you any permission at all to, to go into their country. So this means that the team actually went in within four or five days after the attack occurred. That sounds pretty factual, but let me tell you that it's never happened ever before. Never, ever before. That's so short after a chemical attack or alleged chemical attack, I have to use say, that a team goes in after such a short time. Now, what that means is that the victims are still there if they have not died, the first care responders are there, the medical staff are there, everything is still basically untouched. And that is a fantastic opportunity, and that was something that, that the team found. What did they do? It was an on-site investigation. They went in on four separate occasions in different areas. They interviewed the survivors, they interviewed the first responders, the medical staff, and they reviewed medical records and also collected environmental and biomedical samples. And you can see that here on the slide on the right-hand side where they're taking samples. You can see like the missile that has hit the ground. And the other picture on, on the left-hand side is basically those were the planning missions uh, in the hotel. We had a kind of a boardroom, conference room, and I remember one day we were sitting there and there was a wedding going on in the next room, and you know we were kind of all swinging a little bit to the music. You know, those are kind of the little side notes that, that one has to also keep in mind. Again, what is very difficult, and you have to kind of keep that in mind as well, is first of all, when the team went in, and you can see that, they're all in hazmat suits. It was over 30 degrees centigrade in Damascus at the time. I mean, that's what, 90-something? Uh, it was extremely taxing physically, but I will also tell you it was extremely taxing emotionally because these people saw scenes and they saw the survivors. I didn't bring some of the really scary pictures back, which they have and which are part of the whole case history because they're pretty frightening to see. Uh, but they came back and they were, they were visibly shaken uh, by this experience. And what happened also is the first day they went in, and I have a slide that's coming up very soon, but the first day they went in, uh, they were shot at, and it was a deliberate attack against the team leader, and uh, it was targeted where he was sitting. Uh, you can see it, I mean, on the and the car was compromised. Th we had to turn the whole convoy around, and I, I will also admit to you that I was extremely proud of the team because they didn't sort of say, we're not gonna go back. This is dangerous stuff we're doing here. But when they went around, they didn't even question it. They said, where's the next vehicle? How can we change the vehicle? Let us go back and let's go back in again. So I thought that was really beyond the call of anyone's duty. And if someone had said, I'm not going to go in, I fear for my safety, I would have understood. Now, again, you can't just go to a street corner somewhere and so say, here we are, here's the team. Now, please, can we talk to someone? You have to organize that beforehand. Now, mind you, we were going into rebel-held territory. And that means there's not only a negotiation with one uh, party of the opposition, but there is, in this particular case, there were about 42 of them. Now, you cannot negotiate with 42 factions. They all hold a particular part of whatever area we wanted to go into. So we narrowed it down to five, and we basically said to the five, you, know, you need to all get together and you need to help us. You need to bring people. We're going to visit site X, which could have been a hospital. You know, that's what we did. Because we also needed rooms to interview the, the survivors, to take pictures, photographs, to take videos, to take the case histories. I mean, this was all done, and this is what we would do the night before to basically sit together and map out exactly how the day would, would, would evolve. And here, and this is another interesting picture, this was like one of the mornings, and what happened is that every day, because of the changing security situation with the opposition, we never quite knew whether we could go in on the route that we were supposed to go in. The government said to us, we will ex escort you until you go to the buffer zone. 
And as of the buffer zone, we were on our own. And mind you, the other thing that I had to negotiate with the government was a ceasefire. Because the ceasefire was, sh I mean, the government was shelling all the time, as was the opposition. I mean, this is a fight. That's a war going on. And so initially the government said to me, well, okay, we will do three hours a day. And I said, that's not enough. We can't do three hours a day. Because three hours is not enough for the cars to get there, to take all of the histories, to do the interviews, to take the samples, absolutely not enough. I need longer. Then they compromised and said four hours. In the end, I got five hours. But it was very hard to get them. And then the other problem was is we didn't want them to start shelling the minute that the cars, the convoy, left the area because then it would look like you know, we're in cahoots and you know, they are basically being attacked the minute that we leave that. But this was something that took place every single day before they set out. And you can see they were like on the hood of the car looking at last minute changes that possibly needed to be done. Here is another picture, and this is about what the environment looks like. You know, this is not really, it's, it's a very, uh, lots of houses that are, of course, demolished already. They're bombed. I mean, it's a very difficult area that they went into. We went into a convoy. Uh, they were usually like four or five vehicles. One vehicle was only with the supplies and would also have the samples to bring back. Now, what samples did they bring back? I told you biomedical samples. It could be urine. It could be blood. Uh, uh, it could be tissue. I mean, anything that could basically indicate the, um, the uh, uh, persistence of, of chemical agents. And the biomedical samples meant that if there was a missile, they would take something from the missile. They might take something from the surrounding uh, ground to sort of see what, what could be done. Now, this is a very interesting picture that I wanted to show you. And if you can see, you know, I don't know if you can actually see this. You see the, the red part, that's the two and a half by one and a half uh, kilometer line of the suburb. Oh, oh, no, no. Hold on. There we go. Um, and here is the hotel where we were. And that's called the Four Seasons. And this was the, the, green, the green line is basically one that we were supposed to take, indicated by the government and by our security staff. And this was the way to go in. Still a bit, bit of a distance, right? Now, that one morning, we were told, no, 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 you can't go in this way. But then we had to reroute here. And that's what I was telling you in the, on the car that we were sitting every day to kind of map the route that we would go in because there would always be last minute changes. Very, very difficult to plan. And very, mm, you know, knuckle wrenching, basically. And you can also see, it's not very clear, uh, I didn't bring a, 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 a blow up of this, but it's actually a pretty large area, the Samalka. So you have to know exactly where you're gonna go. And what we would agree with the opposition is that they would actually meet us at the entrance that was predetermined where we would go in, and then they would escort us. And I think that if you look on the YouTube videos, which they posted within like half an hour of the team being there, that they have like, you know, people on motor scooters and whatever, and they're extremely pleased that we actually uh, did go in. Now, <coughs> before we come to this, let me say that uh, the uh, team had done these investigations, and after about five days of this, they were totally exhausted. And I mentioned to you not only the physical, but also the mental exhaustion. And so I took the decision I was going to pull the team out. And the Syrian government was extremely unhappy about that. And they said, you have only done the Hauta investigation. You did not do what we wanted and what we agreed, which was Khan al-Assal Aleppo and the two other in investigations that you, that you agreed on or that you insisted on. And we want you to stay and to conclude this. And I thought that was a valid point. We hadn't done that, but I said, it's my decision. These are not soldiers. These are people who are exhausted. I will bring them back as soon as I can, but I'm not gonna leave them here in the country. They need a break. Now next comes the next problem I just want to share with you, and that is that then we had to get the samples out and we had to get the people out. And that again had to go via Beirut, which was our transit point. Now you cannot transport biomedical blood urine samples because it's considered hazardous material on commercial planes. So I was on the phone for like two days with whatever foreign minister I could muster and say, I need a plane to fly these people out. And that's what I did. We got private planes from several countries, and I'm very grateful that basically they met and they flew them out. The other agreement was, and I'll come to that in a minute, is that the Syrian government, and that's our agreement, they were allowed, they were to entitled, I should say, that the splitting, the samples would be split, meaning that the samples that we took, they could have a bit off, 
I mean, and sometimes the splitting of the samples is a little delicate because they had to have their own proof that that was actually the samples that was taken. What that meant is that we had to fly out two Syrian officials to The Hague, to the OPCW laboratory, where these samples would be split. Then again, it was very difficult to get visas because Syrians don't easily get visas, particularly if it's a European Union country, etc. So we got that organized too. So we flew them out, Syrian officials went along, split the samples, and then these samples had to be flown to various laboratories. The OPCW has a string of laboratories that are accredited, meaning that they follow all the right procedures and whatever. And so we flew them out, and there are two laboratories, because there's one laboratory and a control laboratory. And if they don't agree in their findings, there can be a third one to make sure that everything else is right. So the biomedical samples went to two labs, and the environmental samples went to, to two laboratories. And they did the analysis. And all of this, initially, we sort of said it takes about four weeks to do the analysis. Now, you should have heard the members of the Security Council. They were absolutely livid. They said, it cannot be. You know, we've had, uh, you know, at that time, remember airstrikes were being threatened. You know, you cannot have a month to do this analysis. So again, I got on the phone and I kind of pleaded with everyone to say, put extra people there, put extra money there. No weekends, August. Remember in Europe, you know, this is like prime vacation time. You know, cancel vacations. I want this faster. In the end, we got it in 16 days, which I think is really unprecedented. So, but, you know, that, that was done. So the next, next issue that happened is on 16 September, so you can see the timeline here, the Secretary General presented the report, and the report showed without a doubt that chemical weapons were used on a relatively large scale. And you can see on the left of the Secretary General is Professor Selstrom, our team leader, uh, when he was re presenting the report to the uh, Secretary General. And uh, also, the report is worth looking at. I mean, you can look at it on the UN website. It's actually quite interesting to see. There's some very interesting conclusions in there. Uh, there was obviously a discussion in the Security Council. There was discussion among member states. But, of course, the final report is still outstanding. On 25 September, now you can see the timeline again very short because I'd made the commitment to the Syrians. I'd sent the team back as soon as possible. So on 25 September, the team went back to conclude the fact-finding. Now, what did that mean uh, with Khan al-Assal? Khan al-Assal in near Aleppo happened on the 19th of March. We were now at the end of September. No way you can still find evidence that is actually worthwhile. The other problem was is that it was in the hands of al-Nusra, which is one of the al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, rebel opposition. And our security people said, there is no way we're going to let you go anywhere near that place. It's just too dangerous. So these two factors contributed to our not going to Khan al-Assal, which again, the Syrian government was not happy with because that was the one incident that they had brought forward to the Secretary General and therefore were unhappy that uh, was not uh, investigated by the team. But, in another little twist, the Russian Federation had done their own investigation of Khan al-Assal and they'd given us a report, which, you know, I'm not a scientist, but it was like this thick, with all kinds of laboratory analysis and what have you, and actually, the team leader, Professor Selstrom, did go to Moscow to discuss it with them because obviously what is also in the Secretary General's mechanism is the Secretary General can receive um, investigation or invest information material that he can include in the report even if the mission cannot verify it. With that caveat, the mission cannot verify it, but it was received uh, by, by, by the mission. So now what happens next is that in mid-December, and I can tell you it's next Friday, <laughs> actually, that the report will be presented to the Secretary General and to the Member States on the final report, meaning the Hauta report, of course, was already in 16 September, but the final report on all of the other in allegations will be presented at the end of next week, and there will probably be a very uh, strong discussion because I think that not everyone agrees, particularly uh, the Syrians will take some exception to this, and I think that the Russian Federation also will have strong views on it, so you'll probably follow that. If not in the press, you can always go on the UN website. I'm going to give you one more picture. When I was sitting in the plane flying home to uh, the United States, uh, and for the first time I saw at that time still the International Herald Tribune, that was the picture on the front page of the Herald Tribune, and that was my hotel. Okay. And I can tell you that between July, when I was there the first time, and August, when I went there the second time, the shelling, the mortars, 
have increased tremendously. And since then, it has increased even more, which is a real concern when you think about the team that is there. And I'm not only talking about the chemical team, I'm also talking about the people who deliver humanitarian aid. We've got World Food Program, UNICEF, uh, Humanitarian Affairs, UNDP. I mean, you name it. There are dedicated people there who are trying their best to deliver humanitarian assistance to the population of, of Syria. And most of them live in this hotel. There's one other hotel that is also in, th in, that, in that area. But on the other hand, we are very exposed as an international community. There are practically no more embassies open in Syria. There's the Russian embassy. There's some mm, chargé d'affaires and some embassies, but most of them have closed. So we are very exposed, and that's our constant worry when we're talking about the, uh, the destruction and the next part that I'm coming to, because you also want to know what happens after this. Now. After the issuance of the report on the Gauta incident, you know that on 14, December, uh, 14 September, uh, Russian Federation and the United States agreed to a framework for the elimination of, of uh, Syrian chemical weapons. I can't remember exactly, but I think the 14th September was a Tuesday. And on the 12th of September, uh, the Syrian president and also the prime minister said, oh, no, no, we don't have chemical weapons. We don't own chemical weapons. Two days later, they basically uh, deposit, Syria deposits to the secretary general the instrument of accession, which is a legal document which basically says we would like to join the chemical weapons convention. And on 20 September, within a week, there are timelines there, they submit an initial disclosure of its chemical weapons program. Now, what does it mean? They have to disclose what are the sites, what is the extent of it, how many stocks do they have, do they have munitions already filled, where are the production facilities? So it's a fairly comprehensive program. And that they did it in six days, you really wonder whether they'd been working on this for a bit earlier. But I think everyone was just absolutely amazed that they did it. And on 27 September, the OPCW Executive Council adopts a decision on this program, an accelerated program for achieving the complete elimination of chemical weapons by the middle of next year, namely 30 June. And then the Security Council adopted a resolution, which is 2118, and that basically says, you know, yes, you know, we call for the complete destruction, we call for the complete implementation of this decision, and basically what will happen is the UN and the OPCW will work together. Now, the OPCW, I should say something a little bit about it. The OPCW was established only in 1997. It's a fairly young organization, and it was established precisely to help states eliminate um, their chemical weapons program. Now, what the OPCW does is it verifies. It verifies when a country declares that they would like to join or has joined the CWC, Chemical Weapons Convention, they have to destroy the materials themselves. So that is means that Syria actually has the obligation to destroy it themselves. Now, when they joined and when they declared they wanted to join, they said, we can't do that. We are not able to do that. We're in the midst of a civil war. We cannot destroy this. We cannot destroy 1,000, maybe even 1,200 tons of chemical agents and precursors. We can't do that. So that's when the Russian Federation and the United States stepped in and so said, look, we will discuss this and we will see what we can do. The OPCW doesn't destroy it either. They only verify. They verify the stocks. They verify the destruction. They do not themselves do the destruction. And the other difficulty is, is that, you know, we weren't quite sure where are all of these materials. But what, uh, what, what happened was that uh, you have the Secretary General on 10 October, the Council endorsed the proposals to establish a joint mission, which was very important. And then he appointed Sigrid Kach, who is to the right of the Secretary General, as a special coordinator to lead this team. And so they are like several, four pillars, if I can call it that. One is in New York, one is in The Hague, one is in Cyprus, which is our logistics space, and one is in, um, in Damascus. And what Ms. Kach is doing, the special coordinator, is she's basically trying to liaise with all of the countries to say, how do we best coordinate the destruction? How is the destruction going to happen? And how do we actually get rid of this stuff by 30 June 2014? Now, what do we have now? The joint mission is going to accomplish this in three phases. And the first phase was really the operating capacity in Damascus. And for us, it's always like we call it a light footprint. And a light footprint means as few people as possible. But what the UN has been tasked with is the logistics and the security. 
which is a really heavy part. OPCW sends in the inspectors. We, we provide the whole framework for them going in, and we provide the whole logistics space and the security, which I can tell you is huge uh, to do that. But basically what they did is they did the inspections of the various sites that Syria had declared. They inspected the production facilities, and also they planned the future site visits. And this phase is completed. So as far as we're concerned right now, and that was until the end of November, we are very much on track because phase two, which lasted through one November, also included the verification of all of the sites by the inspectors and also the verified destruction of all chemical weapons production and mixing filling equipment by Syria. That's also been completed. Now, what does that actually mean? Syria themselves had to destroy these facilities. I mean, sometimes it's a little less, you know, taking a sledgehammer or something, but sometimes it's a lot more complicated. And that's another aspect that I'm coming to in a minute, because Syria has asked the international community for a lot of materials to actually help them in the destruction and also in the, in the transport of this. Phase three, which started on 1 November, means ongoing support, and that's a huge task, monitoring verification of all other destruction activities, and then also the destruction of the chemical materials and precursors themselves. Now, when we come to this, and you've read recently in the paper, a lot of the, uh, a lo a lot of the um, um, uh, discussion about where does it get destroyed. Since Syria is not destroying it, they're sort of saying, well, where is it going to be destroyed? And there was, with the, I must say, heroic efforts of the U.S. Secretary of State trying to find a country which would actually be able to destroy this. There had been discussion with Albania, and there had been discussion with Norway, both of which came to naught. So right now, there's no country that is offered to actually destroy this material. Now, there are two ways of destroying it. One is incineration, which means you burn the damn stuff. One other way is hydrolysis, which means that you use water-based components to basically also render it neutral and, and destroy it in that way. So the option is right now that's being considered is to use the so-called hydrolysis uh, material. Now there is still obstacles to be encountered, and that is that you're going to need uh, transportation to get this stuff to the port. And I don't know if it's very visible, but we've, we've put in, you know, we, oh, I'm always getting on the wrong thing here. Um, we have actually, Damascus is down, down, where am I here? Damascus is down here. And this is the road that goes to Homs, and that is hugging the coast, goes to, um, to Tartus, which is also sea base, and then it goes to Latakia, which is the port that's been identified. This is actually about a two-day journey. It's a two-day journey, not because it's a huge distance, but it's also because they're very bad roads. The roads are clearly damaged by the conflict. And now comes the tricky part. The, uh, this area of Homs is very much contested and it switches between government and bet the re rebel uh, po forces, the opposition forces, on a, on, a, on a fairly frequent basis. It was actually uh, open and then for the government, and basically now it's still being contested, so we don't really know exactly how we're going to get it out there, but we're going to have to get it out there. So that is the next challenge, because Syria is responsible for the security of the stuff to be transported. And they've asked, you know, how do you transport these materials, you know, these are in huge drums. And again, the United States has um, flown in a lot of packing material. We actually trained Syrian officials to how to pack chemical materials so that they would not uh, get compromised or they could not, you know, be in somehow in danger anyone. So that's that's another aspect that I think is extremely important that we need to keep in mind. There are a lot of there are a lot of areas that are very prone to to danger points, if I can call it that. But I just wanted to give you an idea of, 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 of the distances. And the other thing is, up here is, is Aleppo. I mean, that's basically where Aleppo is. So that's how far Aleppo is. So it's also an area that is currently totally controlled by the, go by the government. These other two pictures are basically where uh, pictures that were taken from the verification visits, you know, the OPCW inspectors, you know, looking at various facilities and, and tanks and so forth. So that's, um, that's where we are right now. And I'm going to have one more slide, and uh, that is basically uh, how do we go on further. And I think what we have seen, significant progress has been made to the extent that we actually have been uh, saying to the Syrian government, and I've said it publicly, they've given us all the cooperation 
that they should that they that they were supposed to they did give us the cooperation but on the other hand the security situation is of extreme concern and also we need the continuing implementation by the Syrian uh, government of their obligations but we also need the opposition to cooperate with us and because there's so many of them you know it's not like one group that says yes yes we help you but on the other hand there is a continuing discourse and discussion with all of the groups and the international community, which I hate to tell you, is basically going to bear the brunt of the financial uh, burden uh, of this matter because uh, the Syrian government clearly cannot pay for this. And so uh, they have sort of said, well, we can't destroy it in our country. We also cannot pay for it. So there is a cost to having uh, these materials destroyed. And that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you, Angela, for that very uh, exhaustive uh, what will happen after blame is fixed in the final report on either the government or the opposition uh, for using chemical weapons? What do you see as the next stage? Well, as I said, the, uh, the mechanism is neutral in terms of uh, assigning responsibility and accountability. But since the mechanism was established, a lot has happened in the international community. And one of the aspects that I think is extremely important that we now have different mechanisms. There's an international criminal court. You know, there are various other, the, the issue of human rights and the rights of civilian populations, you know, responsibility to protect them, you name it. There are various ways of furthering this. And there was a bit of an outcry, as I'm sure you've seen, because Nabi Pile, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, made comments, I think it was yesterday or the day before, basically already laying the blame at the foot of, of, the, uh, of the president uh, of Syria. I think that this will be taken up. I think it's a little early yet to take it up. I think people wanted to wait for the final report and maybe also to wait what was going to happen you know, in the next couple of months. But I am convinced that it's not gonna rest as it is right now, meaning no one is assigned responsibility. And what is also interesting is because the Syrian government, uh, after this 21 August incident in Ghouta, uh, had brought three other incidents to our attention while I was there, they said, you know, look, I mean, we have like this 22, 24, and 25 of August, there was uh, small scale attacks uh, that happened, and we want you to investigate those as well. And I have some leeway, I mean, the <coughs> Secretary General, but you know, I have some leeway. So I said, yes, we will look at them. Because what I wanted to avoid, that this is somehow seen as a Western campaign against Syria, I mean, you have to be a little bit even handed, because the Syrians were the first to bring it forward. So, you know, you think that they were affected by this and their own troops. And so I wanted to make sure that this was seen as something that was even-handed. But it will not stop there. I'm sure it's going to be taken forward. In what way, I really don't know. But I think it's a little unfair to say to the Secretary General, you must be the one who assigns blame. I think that that is something, the facts speak for themselves. I think they're fairly evident. And I think that the next iteration of this will need to be, will need to be taken up by the international community. And I'm pretty sure it will. <coughs> yes? Yeah, I'm a little curious about the uh timeline because it might indicate the intentions of the government. Uh, uh, we're mostly, <coughs> sorry to say, mostly still back to Hafez Assad, but they've been updated, uh, <coughs> excuse me, continually since then. And maintained. I don't, which timeline do you mean now? Uh, well, I thought the chemical weapons have been there for many decades, haven't they? Do they? Oh, do yeah, they I mean, the chemical weapons. Hafez are more fanatic. You know, I, th here? I, I think, you, they have been there a long time. I, I don't think this was something that was built up in the last year. That was not something that was built up in the last three years. The whole thing goes back to uh, the signature of the non-proliferation treaty. And when you speak to other countries in the Middle East, um, then uh, what happened is that Egypt is one of the few countries, because there are only four countries that are not signatories to the Chemical Weapons Convention. And there are two countries that have signed but not ratified, Israel being one of them and the four countries that you know, have not signed are kind of the usual suspects like North Korea and so forth. But on the other hand, um, the, um, when, when the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty was signed, the countries of the Middle East were basically told that all countries of the Middle East were to sign and that included Israel. And in the end, Israel did not sign. And so some of them, because the Chemical Weapons Convention came subsequently said, as long as Israel doesn't sign the non-proliferation treaty, we will not sign the Chemical Weapons Convention. And that was like a tit for tat at that time. Justified or not, it doesn't really matter, but that's the mindset that people had, that this was in response to other developments in the region. 
And Assad clearly had accumulated, his government had accumulated a large number of chemical weapons and chemical weapon stocks. And so um, this was not something that was, that was recent at all. And it's very interesting because I'm always in favor of talking about transparency and, and disarmament. And uh, the first, the Secretary General wrote a letter to, to Assad some time back when there was I mean, months back before this all started breaking loose. And uh, then uh, we pointed out that there had been some low level reports about the possibility of him using it. And we said, you know, well, we remind you of the fact that this is inhumane weapons and so forth. And then he said, well, he, ab he abided by all of the regulations that were in the, um, in the United Nations and that Syria had signed. But the only one that Syria had signed was a 1925 Geneva Protocol, which forbids, and that goes back to the First World War when a lot of mustard gas and so forth was used, uh, uh, uses in the in case of war. So, and at one point, a couple of years back, they had stated they did not possess chemical weapons, which again is a very important marker in the sand. Anyone? Yes. Well, I think we need a, probably a microphone. I mean, I can hear you, but maybe some others. Um, two questions. One, you said in phase one, which is completed, that you have inspected all of the sites that Syria declared. How do you, with your goal of eliminating all chemical weapons, how do you take into consideration the fact that Syria might not have declared many sites? And also, one other question, um, with your personal and professional experience with Syria and with the officials, why do you think Assad decided to do this at the time? Um, with regard to the second question, let me take that first. Uh, I can only speculate, but I was in Damascus at the time that the threat of the airstrikes was looming very large. And I think that was a very strong factor. I'm convinced of it. Now, I'm interpreting here, I'm basically projecting my own views uh, on them. So um, I, uh, but I do think that that was, that was definitely a consideration. And uh, I'm blocking now on your first question, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, the. Yeah, so in phase one. Um, on the oh yeah, inspection sites, right, so thank you. Um, and in phase one, you know, the, the, the difficulty with the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention and with the OPCW approach is that um, the OPCW's inspectors inspect the sites that have been declared so then the question is, are there any other undeclared sites? We don't know that. Now, we also have heard through various rumors, reports, that there might be more than the 23 sites that they did declare. But when you actually look at this, the 23 sites included more than one site. So one site is like, could have several subsites. And then when you add up those subsites, it was actually 42 sites. But there is one site that they did not physically inspect because it was in River Hill territory. And we are told, I mean, this I have from OPCW because we don't really deal with this at the UN, but I understand what happened is they mounted cameras with GPS on the real time, you know, they kind of could look at this all the time, and OPCW is satisfied that that actually constitutes a physical inspection. So they have gone along with that. But with regard to possible undeclared sites, I can't give you that answer because no one has it. What did worry us initially is because so much of the territory is now not under government control that there is a possibility that some of the materials could have fallen into rebel hands. This is something that the government has actually alleged that chemi you know, the, the, the opposition did have their hands on some of the chemical material. But when it comes to the Hauta report, and this is an interesting uh, statistic, I don't know if you, know, you remember the sarin attack in the Tokyo submarine and the subway in 95, I think it was. And it killed nine people, sickened many others, but it killed nine people, which is not a high death toll. And the reason why it only, I must say that, killed nine people was because it was sarin in very pure form. It evaporates a lot faster in the atmosphere if it's in pure form. And that points to an amateurish attack. People did not know how to add additives to it in a way that would stabilize it and make it last a lot longer. The ones that were used and that were analyzed from the samples in Hauta were a lot more sophisticated. I may I have to take a pen down so I don't forget any of the questions. Um, yes, could, could someone turn around? Yeah, I want to take someone from this side too. Yes, the two gentlemen in the front. Thanks very much. Um, 
I'm interested in the comments that you made about the difficulties with accessing these sites and indeed for humanitarian actors in particular. Um, two questions would be, given that there are areas outside of Damascus, near the areas that the chemical weapons teams were able to uh, access, um, what does this say about uh, access for humanitarian actors and what's required in terms of political will uh, to, to see the same be possible for aid and medicine and food getting to the siege areas outside of Damascus. And then separately, with respect to negotiating access with opposition groups in, in those areas, just sort of logistically, how does that work? You have intelligence beforehand about who is there and who are the, the right people to be speaking to, or is it just sort of walking up when the sort of knocking on the door, so to speak, and, and seeing who answers? Uh, with regard to humanitarian access, one of the main problems is is that um, the population that is particularly in the fighting areas, now mind you, you've got close to over 110,000 people who have died with conventional weapons. You know, we forget that. We focus on the chemical aspect. But there are a lot of people who have died with conventional weapons, and the whole area is destabilized. All the neighboring countries have, you know, a lot of people, millions of people who they're hosting in terms of refugee camps, and it's destabilized the whole borders and the inside situation. But when it comes to the humanitarian access, basically what it means is that the access needs to be given to areas that are in the rebel-held territories. And the government is not happy with that because what they're saying is you give food not only to the young people and the children and the old people, but this benefits the fighters. These are people who are fighting our government. So they're very reluctant to grant access and that's our main problem. The next problem is that, that we have partners. I mean, we have a number of people in, in, in the UN, in Damascus, to work on that, but they are not enough. I mean, they rely on the, on the national groups to basically deliver that aid. And they may be lacking vehicles, they may be lacking everything, and sometimes the roads are blocked. So the humanitarian access is really a, a very difficult issue. Now, we are now working towards a political solution, which I hope is going to uh, happen. There's a Geneva conference taking place on the 22nd of uh, January. I don't know it's going to be the end all and be all, but it's a good start, which we hope will bring progress, because you're going to have to settle this somehow. Because the other thing that we are seeing is that there is a fatigue, a donor fatigue. The Secretary General wants to launch another appeal for humanitarian assistance for $4.2 billion in January. I mean, we're running through a lot of money trying to satisfy the needs, not only inside the country, but also the refugees. Countries like Turkey, like Jordan, you know, they don't have the means to feed all of a sudden and house all of a sudden, you know, two million people. It's very, very difficult. Now, when it comes to the opposition groups, yes, we have ways of dealing with it, but I'd rather not speak <laughs> about the details of it for fear of giving that a, that a rump. But yes, there have to be contacts because what you want to make sure is that when the team goes in, that they are received and that they are safe. Uh, and it is not easy and it's very time consuming. And the other, th the other <coughs> issue is that basically, when I talked about the physical exhaustion, it wasn't only the physical exhaustion because it's emotionally and physically taxing and it's the heat and it's the hours, but basically the team would come back to the hotel and I would say to them, you got an hour and a half to rest up and then we would meet and then they had to pack away the samples and get their gear, etc. <coughs> an hour and a half and then we met back and then we met until 11, 12 o'clock at night just to plan for the next day and get everything ready for the next day. So these were very, very intense days. <coughs> next, you had a question, sir. No, the gentleman in the front. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up on your comments about the 110,000 killed by conventional weapons. It seems that um, really your success and the success of the joint OPCW UN mission has had a very damaging and perverse effect, which is to alter the narrative of the conflict and alter almost everyone's perception of it. Um, less than 1% of fatalities have been killed by chemical weapons. Um, how, where do you go now um, in uh, you know, the UN, UN disarmament more broadly? How can we all uh, change this narrative and start addressing uh, what really matters to the vast majority of Syrian civilians? whether that's incendiary weapons, cluster munitions, artillery fire, or just the denial of humanitarian access, as we've just discussed. Thank you. I think that's a very good question. Thank you for asking this. It gives me a chance to make an additional plug here for something else. Um, but um, I think it's very hard to get traction for, for conventional weapons and for the sheer numbers of it. 
because you don't kind of see it. I mean, you see dead bodies and you, know, you can f photograph them in the street. You see that all over, it doesn't have to be in Syria. But on the other hand, uh, I just came from Canada. Uh, I was there for two days and I gave a lot of interviews. Canada has not signed the Arms Trade Treaty. And the Arms Trade Treaty was concluded in, in, in March of this year after a long, several years of negotiation. And it's really not a disarmament measure, but it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a trade regulation. And what it means, and I kind of discussed with the government and I discussed with civil society and with parliament, and I said, you know, look, I mean, what holds you back? And they're saying, oh, but you know, I mean, we have these concerns that, uh, you know, people in this country, our hunters could not have guns anymore. Of course, got nothing to do with anything inside the country. But what it means, and this is really important, is that when you export weapons, you basically have to give a declaration that these weapons are not going to be either sold to a government that is uh, responsible for human rights abuses or there's being going to terrorists or groups that are using it for nefarious purposes. So actually the humanitarian and the human rights provisions in that treaty is, is, are actually very good. And when you look at how do these arms get there, I mean, how did these arms all get to? Look, I mean, we have a very bad situation like in Mali and where did, the, where did the weapons all come from in Mali? They all came from Libya. After Libya kind of fell, if I can call it that, basically all these arms go across the border and they get traded and so forth. So this is something, it's a very, very hard case to make. And arms, arms industry is huge. It's tripled over the last three, four years, maybe even less than that. It is a huge business and very, very profitable. Because basically you shoot the arms, you, you destroy them, I mean you basically use them up and then you need to buy new ones. And when you look at what's happening, when you look actually, I got some statistics and I don't have them all you know, right now in front of me, but when you actually look at some of the statistics, the whole Middle Eastern countries, what they are ordering, the orders that they have for weapons are enormous. And the thing is that a lot of them can afford it because they have oil. So it is a region that I think is, is in, in danger of becoming ever more unstable because also this arms build up and the instability in the whole region. Okay, now we're gonna take someone from the middle. Yes, the lady in the striped sweater. My understanding, I believe, from reading an article in the New York Times in the last month or so, was that there were American chemical companies that were selling the pre precursor ingredients to the Syrian government um, to help stockpile these weapons. Now, I don't know whether they were getting the pre precursor ingredients from a lot of different uh, companies from a lot of different countries, but um, um, I'm just curious about the laws that might prevent um, Dow and other chemical companies from selling these kinds of ingredients to um, other countries who are stockpiling chemical weapons. Well, it's a legitimate question. My country, Germany, has also been accused of that, but there is a legitimate chemical industry. And so it's not easy to distinguish between what is a precursor and what can actually be used to make chemical weapons or not. So there's a lot of gray zone there. And uh, that's basically part of the problem that you don't really know. I mean, if you import chemical stocks. Now the chemical weapons, uh, the, the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, they not only inspect sites, but part of their inspection program also means that they go to chemical companies and inspect and sort of, you know, whether they look at the books or whatever, I really don't know. But that is part of the whole problem. Now, I do want to mention something else, and I mentioned it to the young lady, Michelle, who picked me up downstairs. Uh, just as I was coming over here, I read in the car that um, there was just a now another allegation of a chemical attack in, uh, in Syria. And apparently it was like 68 kilometers north of Damascus. You'll probably see it on the news or in the paper. I don't know if it makes the paper. It was supposed to be small, small scale. But now that does no longer fall <coughs> under the Secretary General's mechanism because it's now... Syria is a member of the Chemical Weapons Convention, so that would pass to the OPCW to actually investigate that. I'll take someone from over here. Yes. Ms. Kane, thank you very much for sharing with us your insight and perspective from the, literally the trenches. My question is, um, we heard earlier, you shared with us, that uh, Syria did not accept uh, P5 members to participate in the, in the um, investigation, but then we we also heard that uh, Russia was uh, delivered their own report, which implies that they were allowed to go inside Syria uh, and <coughs> investigate. Is that correct? So, what is uh, what is the UN's take on that, and was that discussed with the Syrian government? Thank you. Uh, they didn't accept P5 members because they felt there was tremendous bias there, 
on clearly not the Russian Federation or maybe China, but, but the other three. And as I said, you know, this, this really gave us a bit of a headache in terms of, you know, to staff the mission with people who were not from the P5. Uh, but we did it. And I think, you know, we had an extremely competent and, and experienced team. Uh, the Syrians can invite whoever they want to do their own analysis. So clearly, unbeknownst to me, I only found out about it when they presented me with a report that they had gone in, this Russian team had gone in and, um, and uh, made their own analysis of Khan al-Assad. I don't remember exactly when, but it was about two months after, maybe three months afterwards. And uh, so uh, they had a very exhaustive report that they shared with us. And as I mentioned, under the mechanism, it says explicitly that if there are other reports or from member states, and this clearly was brought to the Secretary's attention by a member state, that can be looked at and referred to in the report. Now, if it is the team report, they will say this report was brought to our attention without endorsing the, the findings. But still, it is legitimate that a member state brings it to the attention of the Secretary General. Now, when it comes to the um, current destruction and everything else going on, I don't think that this is any longer the case. We have not, I mean, I have not discussed it with them, and I think that now that is in a different stage, so this P5 restriction, as I would call it, is no longer applicable. One yes. more question. One more question. One, the lady in the back. Sorry, yes. yes. Good. I, was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how social media has kind of affected the investigation, so particularly YouTube being a source for a lot of information on the potential attacks, um, as well as also just figures like, say, Brown Moses, bringing what? Brown Moses, Elliot Higgins, one of the bloggers who has really been kind of pushing a lot of this outward to journalists to help filter out the information. The blogger. The oh, blogger. The blogger. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and just kind of, <laughs> yeah, so pretty much how, how has YouTube, how has Twitter, affected not just your investigations, but also how the world has interacted with dealing with the attacks? Well, it's had a huge effect. And uh, I referred already to the Hauta incident, which was really the only one where we had as extensive a coverage. And I think part of the reason was also because, you know, we'd alerted everyone. We were there, we were going in, you know, so they have found an immediate audience, world audience, uh, to put this uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the web, but also because they had put all the victims on the web. There had been other reports before, and again, uh, coming to, uh, to the Russian Federation, they had given us a video, they had given me a video of a video that was shot by a Russian television reporter, and uh, that showed a lot of animals dying and whatever. But, you know, there was no, there was no what we call chain of custody. There was no way of knowing where it actually was filmed. It could have been anywhere. It could have been in Syria. There was nothing to indicate the basis for it. And that was the other thing is because what happens is that we were offered gratuitously nearly, I should say, a lot of samples from all kinds of people, victims, people who knew victims, uh, doctors who had taken samples from the body. And they said, please, please, you know, here are our samples. You know, you must take this. And the team is not allowed to take these. They are not allowed to accept them as evidence because you have no chain of custody. You've got no clue where this could come from. It could be adulterated, you know, it could be anywhere. So unless they take the sample themselves, they're not, it's not credible because there's no chain of custody. That was very unfortunate, I think, in the view of many member states also who felt that we should have accepted that. But I think that uh, YouTube really changed this whole equation to see the first hand victims, you know, to see the effects of this attack was just huge. And then to see the inspectors going in to take the samples and to see them in full hazmat suits and here you have this unprotected population. And another thing you asked about this humanitarian supplies, you know, we tried to get gas masks and we tried to get actual materials to act also to the people and also atropine, you know, to basically stimulate them if they go into shock or something. They are not, we're not allowed to do that. I mean, because the Syrian government said you cannot take in this material. So there are frustrations where we would have liked to help the population even more, and we were absolutely not able to do that. So that was, you know, one of the frustrations when you work there. But on the other hand, you know, I think that by shedding light on this whole issue and, and, and basically exposing it for what it was and taking another side, a factual side, to the YouTube videos, I think was extremely important. 
Personally, I was not allowed to speak to the press at all until after the report on how it was out. And that's basically, so you know, you saw these pictures of me entering the hotel and going out of the hotel, and that was about it. But um, afterwards, then they sort of said, you must really talk to the press, and I did do quite extensively. So um, it, it, it really helped, but it also helped because it wasn't only at this audience in the United States, because it was also to the Middle Eastern audience and to other audiences around the world. No. Angela, you represent the United Nations at its very best. Thank you very much for gracing our forum.